So it is with great delight that we welcome John Stanisi tonight. It's been years and years since he's been here, uh, and we're so happy to have him. Uh, John is the author of four books, Estasy Among Ghosts, Sleepwalking, it's over there, Dance Against the Wall, and After the Bell. And his fifth book, um, Hallelujah Time, uh, a poem that's based on the music of Bob Marley, is at press right now. The ink is wet, so he couldn't bring it. <laughs> uh, John has been published in numerous, numerous journals. I won't go through all of those. Uh, and he's also, his poems have also been selected by Garrison Keillor several times uh, to be read on the Writer's Almanac. One poem, Cardinals, that John wrote for his wife, Carol, uh, aired. And after the airing, John had several requests of people that wanted to use that poem for weddings and anniversaries. In fact, he even had one, if I understand this correctly, <laughs> one California dress designer who wanted to print the poem on a tag inside the garments that she was making. So we thank you, Carol, for inspiring him. <laughs> John has received many awards. In 1998, he was named the New England Poet of the Year by the New England Association of Teachers of English. Twice he's been nominated for the Pushcart, Pushcart Prize. He received the 2011 Connecticut Book uh, Award for Poetry and he has also been awarded the Sunken Garden Poetry Award for Adult Writers. But John's not just a writer of poetry, he's also a fine teacher. He has taught many years at the Bacon Academy where he also directed theater programs. He is the coordinator of the uh, Hillstead Museums Fresh Voices uh, Poetry Competition for High School Poets. And he ha also has been a judge uh, for the Connecticut Poetry Out Loud program, also uh, for teenagers. But he's a teacher of all ages, not just teenagers. And if you see one of his workshops announced, um, don't think twice, sign up for it. Uh, Jane Muir here in the front and I were lucky to be in his workshop on Villanelles uh, several years ago uh, at the Hillstead Museum. And I hope to get into some more workshops as we go along. Um, John's poetry is accessible and inviting. It's often about nature and family. It's sensual. Uh, but not sentimental. Um, you know, usually, I don't know if you're like me, but usually I get a poetry book and I don't read it from cover to cover. I read a poem here and there. But when I bought Estacy Among the Ghosts, I got to the very beginning, and one of the first poems is The Broken Arm. And once I read that poem, I couldn't put the book down. I had entered a world I wanted to stay in. And so um, John gave me permission to read just the last stanza of that poem. So this is a poem, The Broken Arm, that takes place when John was in third grade, climbing a peach tree, uh, gathering peaches in Mrs. Lewis's yard. He fell and broke his arm. The time went by, and by the end of the summer, the arm was healed. And the last stanza goes like this. I stash the cast in my desk drawer, and that whole summer, 
until my arm puffs up enough to make the cast too tight. I slip it on occasionally and tell everybody, everyone, excuse me, the arm is broken again. <laughs> the need for love swelling inside me like peaches ripening in the sun. <laughs> you gotta want more after you read that. <laughs> and so I am so pleased to invite John up to read. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> what a silly kid, huh? <laughs> uh, I, I want to begin by thanking Evelyn and Gwen and Norman and Audrey and Ed and the the, uh, the wonderful poets in the in the uh, open mic: Corrine, Norman, Laura, Gabriel, Victor, Gordon, and Daniel for a fine, really fine open mic. Thank you very much. Um, I always love coming to. Uh, to Guilford. My first trip here was way back in the 1980s. Katrina Van Tassel invited me all those years ago, and she would invite me back every year, and I would spend the day at Guilford High School with the kids. And, um, and then I read one time at a little wooden house. Dudley Farm. D Dudley Farm. Dudley Farm. Um, and that was one of the last times, actually, that I saw Katrina. So, um, yeah, it's nice to be back in Guilford. Um, I'd like to start with some poems about summer. Not spring. We're going to jump directly to summer. Uh, yeah, I've, winter has tested all of us beyond uh, the max. So, uh, so here are some uh, what I would characterize as hot poems. Um, this, <laughs> this is a poem about the, the feeling you get, like if you stay in a boat too long or if you stay in the water too long during the day and then you get into bed at night and you feel the bed rocking. I would do that on purpose in my canoe. I would put my canoe offshore, anchor it, and sort of collect the ocean for later. Um, so this is called Before the Jet Skis. Before the jet skis and the power boats, before the children dressed like candy, before the clank and metallic racket of pots and pans and the chime of forks on plates, before the quiet voices of water boiling or eggs breaking, even before the muddled collage of human conversation crackling on the edges of everything, there was the turn hovering, the osprey circling, calling out loudly before falling headlong into blackness, eyes fixed on what sustains them, flashing and darting there, barely visible beneath the rocking surface. And how magical it is to know that by entering the sea and staying there long enough, the sea will enter me. That when things quiet and evening comes, I can save that peaceful swaying inside myself and call upon it to roll me so lightly through the surface of sleep that I will not remember the going even after I've returned. <clears throat> Um, I've, I've read where if you see a little fawn um, exploring, that you can be sure that his mother is close by, perhaps on a bed of uh, leaves or, or grass. And I had a, a phenomenal uh, encounter uh, <laughs> with a fawn one early morning. It was just awesome. So this poem is uh, <clears throat> cleverly entitled Fawn. It starts with an epigraph uh, from Elizabeth Bishop from the pink dog. Uh, Bishop says, a depilated dog would not look well. Dress up, dress up, and dance at carnival. Fawn. In the carnival of lights and shadows at dawn, a small bony dog stands in the road. Elizabeth's dog, watching me cautiously from the center line. So I slow for her. And then I see the dabs of softened white her right ear twitches, a wary, cautious twitch, and she lopes into the woods, leaving me with a sense of joy at having seen this tiny fawn. But just as I am about to leave, I hear her squawk and see her just behind the scrub on the side of the road where she is watching me, her wise and fearful eyes too big for her. 
What are you doing, I say to her, and where is your mother? <laughs> she hears my voice and steps back onto the road. Looking me straight in the eyes, she bleats a question, but before I can respond, another car comes speeding by and off she runs for good before I even have the chance to say that I would lie down near her in the woods while she slept, sheltered on a nest of leaves. And when her mother returned, then I would go, having kept her safe from the likes of me. <clears throat> um, one summer evening, I had a, a great time watching a parade of my grandchildren running around the yard trying to catch fireflies. <laughs> it, was, it was quite a show. Uh, and so this, uh, this poem was born of, of uh, witnessing that futility. <laughs> Oh, it's called Firefly. It's for, my, it's for my grandson, Michael. Firefly. In the heaviness of a July evening, I watch a parade of my grandchildren follow the quirky lilt of a firefly. Michael leads, arms outstretched, a plastic cup in one hand, hope in the other. It's slow work and silent, pursuing that little blossom of light all over the yard. Right in front of him, between cup and palm, it vanishes into darkness and catches fire again, just out of reach, over his head. And I feel utterly his urge to capture that tiny bolt of light, the thrill of not knowing when it will vanish, where it will reappear, and will he ever, ever hold it for a moment up close to marvel at the tiny creature that finds its way, just as Michael does, guided by the light of its own little body. <clears throat> um, as Evelyn mentioned, I have a new book coming out, which is called Hallelujah Time, and it is based on um, the songs of Bob Marley, two albums in particular, Burnin' and Exodus. And basically, what the, the book began uh, by, uh, because I was curious about which biblical quotes inspired Bob to write the songs. And it's, it was really fascinating to me to find the biblical quote and then find Bob's paraphrase in the songs. Um, and so I, I started with that, and then from there, tried to get um, a sense for what, um, for what Bob was getting at in the song, and then try to sort of find that same sensibility in my own poems, if that makes sense. Um, so this is, you'll probably, you'll probably find the titles of the uh, poems familiar. This is called Burning and Luton. <clears throat> it's actually a ballad. Um, and it starts with, uh, with the quote from the song, Burning and Luton, by Bob Marley. Could not recognize the faces standing over me. They were all dressed in uniforms of brutality. My youngest son, when he was 12, he and a friend of his had a BB gun, and they went, to, uh, they went behind uh, a vacant, an old vacant factory in Manchester and began shooting out the windows of the factory, and someone called the police. And so this is the story of that, uh, that evening and my 12-year-old boy, Vernon and Luton. One autumn night they met down by the factory, bleak and hollow, the stars above the shattered glass were the light that they would follow. They didn't dare to go inside where shadows might have faces and bony arms might hold them there. Imagination races. No, they preferred the parking lot behind the shabby shop, the battered asphalt splayed by weeds back where the moonlight dropped. Halloween was in the air, cool and mischievous, they snuck behind the shadows, how they were villainous. With BB guns and no real plan, they hustled around the back and opened fire excitedly on the windows that were cracked. And one could hear the falling glass as voices off the sea present themselves to distant ears as clear as they can be. And so the cops were summoned there to where the shots were fired to drop the hammer on these offenders and the trouble they inspired. Eight cruisers poured into the lot, tires and sirens wail, 
suffusing the villains with their lights against the building's shale. And when the cops could see their eyes and knew that these were kids, you might have thought that they'd back off, take a different tack instead. They might have hearkened back to their own adolescent days and the allure of a vacant plant in the evening's <coughs> haze, its windows begging to be smashed. There's little harm in this boyish act, this rite of passage, this childish carelessness. But they came in brutal uniforms. One knelt on a neck. Move a muscle and you're dead, brandishing his Glock. And I wonder, was it really worth it, this vicious show of strife, to treat these kids like criminals so they'd hate you all their life? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I always felt that Bob's song, I Shot the Sheriff, <laughs> was really about being willing to admit to doing one thing, but not being willing to admit to do another, doing another thing. And I thought to myself, man, I've done that so many times in my life, I need to write about it. So, uh, and, and, oh, and, and one more thing, if, if it, each, of the, each stanza ends with a couplet that if you were to sing it, you could sing it to, I shot the sheriff, but I didn't shoot the deputy. I'll try not to read it that way, but I think you'll hear it. Um, so this is I shot the sheriff, and um, it uh, begins with a, a, a line from Bob's song. He says, every day the bucket go a well, one day the bottom I go drop out. Bob Marley, this is I shot the sheriff. I didn't do it, Billy wept, bouncing up and down on the edge of the hardwood chair and punching his finger at me as I came in. He did. He did it. Johnny wrote the word. He was the third grade vandal who had defaced the book room with a marker that I'd stolen from Sister Maria Richards' gray metal desk, but he wasn't telling the truth. And I was shocked. It was true I had removed a couple of books from the shelf, but I didn't do the graffiti. It was Billy who quickly scrawled the word ass on the wall before I replaced the books to hide the word immediately feeling remorse. I've never forgotten the image of him selling me out through his fear and tears, crying and calling my name. All oh, the lessons I learned that afternoon. I took the books down, but I didn't tag the wall that day. <laughs> You hear it? <laughs> when we were only kids, 13 or so, I'd sneak out of my room at 2 a.m., shift my father's battered van to neutral, roll down the driveway, and start it on the run. Mark would sneak out and wait for me in the shadows of the hedges in front of his house. Then we'd drive the length of Old Main Street, and every time we passed the sign that read, Speed is checked by radar, I would yell, fuck the radar, and drop it into low. The van would lurch and growl, and we would laugh. This was a coming of age, a rite of passage whose adolescent light was fading out. And though we couldn't comprehend the truth, Old Main Street was getting smaller, and we were moving farther and farther away from innocence. I'd sneak the van out but I never took the Dodge Coronet. <laughs> it seems the older I get, the more Vietnam tries to pry its way into the things I write, the words I say. And yet, if truth be told, my tendency these days is not to resist, but rather let those thoughts of cowardice and lies and violent death and anger born of confusion so profound it covered me, let them make their way back to the front shabby old veterans of my imagination and live where the season's diversities bevel the past, making things seem much smoother than they are, like now. The cold has come and the moon is out, a little hole too small to push your head through, but big enough to remind you of the light that is beyond our capacity to comprehend. There it is, pressing against the dark. I shot at targets, but I never killed a human being. This is one of those poems that isn't sure what it's trying to say, or maybe it's me. Either way, there's self-indulgence here, an attempt to justify even those times when what occurred was well beyond my means to challenge it. It's 
the way it was. But the way it was is endearing in a way. This is a comfort. The years gone by, the body giving in, and yet what's wild takes on a meaning I can actually pray about. The birds were clay, but now they're jittery visitors who come in droves to my feeders every day. And the deer beneath the apple tree and moon still nibble the frozen apples on the ground. These are what I'm drawn to now, because this is the kind of feral you cannot touch. I postured as bad, but I really was a foolish child. And then one more from that book. This is Get Up, Stand Up. I like reading this one to my students because it's really, it really is like a call to arms to, to not waste a minute of any day. Um, oh, and, and then I, I, I was amazed to read, I wanted to, use, I wanted to use those bars of dust that you see in sunlight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I read about them and you'd be amazed. I mean, do you know the stuff that's in them? You find out in the poem, there's stuff in there you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Makes you want to wear a mask all the time, you know? <laughs> so this is Get Up, Stand Up. <clears throat> Before the love in, the sit down, or the uprising, you will notice from the vast valley of groundless sleep that the light has begun to shift, to move imperceptibly across the dark room in widening stripes of bright light. And you may be tempted to turn over, curl up, and resist the sunrise. Before you save the children, feed the homeless, or chant down the tea party, you must confront that ascending cocktail of dust. The pollen and hair, paper and fibers, minerals and soil, the burnt out meteors and human cells that waft in lengthening cones of sunlight. You'll have to acknowledge the tonnage of your legs, the pain and weakness, the monumental focus necessary to move them and feel the cool floor solid beneath your feet. Get up. Stand up into that massive reach of light and move past the maple's marbled disease, the pond wimpling the trees and the sky, and farther touching the entire landscape at once, beyond the unwrapped birches, into the far hills rolling over themselves, devouring the air deeply out beyond the inconsequential words spoken under low yellow lights and farther still, out to where listening is the prayer spiriting your fears, while behind you always the great voice sounds its trumpet. Um, three years ago, my father lost his 10-year-long battle with Alzheimer's. 10 years. Um, and so uh, these are just a, a few poems about, about that, uh, that whole situation. Um, this is called D-L-R-O-W. The first test they give him is to see if he can spell world backwards, which he can easily. Such demeaning, useless exercises at Yale, Mecca of Miracles, where my mother is sure they'll give him a pill one day to reverse it all and bring him back. But for now, no matter the day of the week, his birth date, the season, the one thing he knows for sure is that the world is backwards, and it will be that way from now on. Uh, my father only had one tattoo, unlike the rest of the guys in our family who like had just little pieces of skin showing. <laughs> God, that's unbelievable. You know? 
his whole sleeves, you know. I don't know. He had a little thing right here, a little signature. That's all he had. <clears throat> this is called tattoos. Unlike the other men in the family, my father has no chains or skunks with attitude or his last name over crossed Italian flags. No mom or born to run. No broken heart, no Semper Fi, no naked ladies or dice. My father has no Jolly Rogers or devils, no angels, crosses, lions, dragons, or knives. He has no rosary beads or praying hands, no virgin with child, U.S. Army, or dove. My father has no sacred heart of Jesus. But on the inside of his left forearm, there's one tattoo no bigger than a signature and the same shade of faded blue as the bruises that blossom on his papery yellow skin. And as he sits in his big reclining chair, smiling vaguely and squeezing a stuffed animal, I glimpse the washed out ink that tells the story. Johnny and Dolly, faded and just about gone. And then one more. This, uh, this is a poem about, you know, I waited. I waited for mm, nine years for the day when he wouldn't know me. But I never asked him. You know, I never asked him. People, would, people who weren't around him a lot, they would, they would like, quiz him and then get frustrated when he didn't know the answers, you know. And I would take them aside and say, just leave him alone. Yeah. Don't, don't quiz him. He's not going to know the answers. Just leave him alone. Let him do what he does. But one day we were in the in the and I didn't know if he knew me or not. And one day we were in the kitchen, having coffee, and and uh, so I just asked him. So this is called absence. When was the last time you saw your son? I asked my father, sitting next to him at the table. He wrinkles his brow, thinks deeply. My son. Jesus, I haven't seen him in a long time. And I think maybe he's right. Maybe I have been gone a long time. Maybe I've been gone for years. And then, um, when he passed away, uh, we... we uh, uh, my two sons and I and some of my uncles, we stood next to him uh, as he lay in the casket. And I had, uh, I had a, um, I brought a pint of Jack Daniels in. <laughs> and I, I flashed it at the funeral director and said, <laughs> and he went. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I opened it up. And my sons and I and my uncles uh, stood there at the casket and, uh, and drank that bottle of Jack Daniels. Um, and... It, at, at the moment, it was a beautiful moment. But then as a little bit of time went by, and I started to think to myself, what, what the hell were we toasting exactly? You know, what, what are these things that we, that we toast? So uh, anyway, this is called Wake. You never said a word about where you went that time you disappeared for five days straight. I stared out the window and had to invent your car pulling in and what you would say about where you'd been. But no one said a word about it ever, or about when your angry, broken sternum looked so bad, a hard-boiled egg just beneath the skin. The only thing that you would ever do whenever someone mentioned you and Gus coming home all bloodied and carrying your shoes was laugh a wily laugh about the fuss and say you'd bring that one to the grave. You never spoke a word about the tiny rooms in the two-bedroom walk-up where you'd have to share the rats, the noise, the booze, the gloom with Angelo and Jenny and eight kids. Or why you chose to change your name to John. Was it some fear you'd end up on the skids? Giovannero Emmanuel needed to be gone? You never explained the demons in your brain that dragged you into the Venus Lounge each night just ahead of closing time disdain ablaze and brandished in the beers, held tight between the fingers on both your meaty hands, eight beers held high and spilling above your head, a message to the bouncers to just stand aside a while and watch the way you'd feed the jukebox. 
chromium decadent UFO blasting dirty white boy through the roof, or Lou Reed telling us how the colored girls go in doo-wop speak, a nonsense kind of truth. It's hard to imagine how much you didn't tell about the cases of gallons of gallo in the car, the pills you used to crash but not to fall, how you became the mayor of every bar. We're cracking the seal on a brand new bottle of Jack next to you here in the maudlin funeral light. You looking like you're about to express some fact. Us raising a bottle in the air to God knows what. Um, many years ago, I found myself in the unenviable position of owing an unsavory character some money, <laughs> which I didn't have the means to pay back. And um, one day he insisted that I meet him um, to talk about <laughs> to talk about getting the money back in. So this is called peace. That would be P I E C E. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Cavatelli loaned me some dough. It wasn't much, yet I wasn't able to pay him back in a timely manner, so he started calling, which I knew was trouble. I was cautious, but I wasn't gullible. He always seemed happy. Johnny, what do you say? Meet me over at Lou's. It was unavoidable. Because I owed him money, I had to play. Luz was a greasy spoon built years ago, and here he comes in his paneled van to inveigle me to climb aboard so we can go around back to show me something special. He's waving out the window, his voice a gargle, and I can see he's grinning in that way he does to make his face unreadable, and because I owed him money, I had to play. He emerges from the van to begin the show, which always starts with a big hug, like something sacral, this is the opening act, and you can't forego the part of the right where you feel vulnerable. You know he's right, but you also know he's liable to snap and call you out about the way you seem to duck him. So you begin to babble. Because I owed him money, I had to play. He held it in his hands, as in a cradle, and then handed it to me, said, feel its weight. It felt heavy, like a slab of marble. And because I owed him money, I had to play. <sighs> yeah, I did. I made it. I made it. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is uh, this is for a former student of mine, a beautiful kid. Oh my goodness, he was just a beautiful. He never spoke. He never, he, he never spoke, and yet all the kids loved him. They would just flock to him. And he would come to my class, and he had, he had notebooks that were, that were this fat with his drawings in them. And he would, his face would be right next to the paper, and he would draw, and he would be like, dun, 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 he'd be doing, he'd be like the soundtrack of, of what he was drawing. Uh, so this is called Pen and Ink. The boy who never speaks keeps his head down, his eyes an inch away from his desk. He's creating super monsters with his black pen, villains and heroes. He hums action music, and when he raises his eyes, he smiles warily, proudly at his newest creature all muscle and detail and weaponry. And I think it just doesn't matter whether our place here is an interior place, landlocked and surrounded by mountains, or next to the sea, open to the rolling in and out of all things imaginable and beyond. Nor does it matter whether our homes are large or small, venerated and lavish, or fashioned simply 
from thin black lines on a clean white page. Um, okay. In the um, oh, you know what I'm going to read. I, I, I'm gonna, uh, oh, and I wanted to make a correction too. Um, uh, I I didn't win the um, the uh, Sunken Garden <laughs> Adult Poetry Book Contest. I was I judged it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this one's kind of tough for me to admit, but you'll find out anyway. So uh, I also didn't win the Connecticut Book Award. Uh, I judged it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. But the stuff that Evelyn said about cardinals is absolutely true. I, I, you know, it's like every year I get these people. They want it for their Christmas cards. They want it for their weddings. Um, it's just wild. And the and and there's a line of clothing at some kooky place in California that's called cardinals, and apparently. This poem is on the tag. It's just so weird. It's very weird. But the bottom line is that the poem is carols. Um, so here it is. Cardinals. Um, I, I'm going to read um, three more. When I'm at a reading, I like to know where I stand. Like, oh, God, how much longer do I have to put up with this guy? <laughs> you know? Okay. Cardinals for carols. I had seen them in the tree and heard they mate for life, so I hung a bird feeder and waited. By the third day, sparrows and purple finches hovered and jockeyed like a swarm of bees fighting over one flower. So I hung another feeder. But the squabbling continued, and the seed spilled like a shower of tiny meteors onto the ground where starlings had congregated. And blue jays, annoyed at the world, disrupted everyone except the morning doves who ambled around like plump old women poking for the firmest head of lettuce. <laughs> then, early one evening, they came, the only ones. She stood on the periphery of the small galaxy of seed. He hopped among the nuggets, calmly chose one seed at a time, carried it to her, placed it in her beak. She, head tilted, accepted it. Then they fluffed, hopped, did it all over again. Filled with love, I phoned to tell you over and over about each time he celebrated being there all alone with her. <laughs> okay. uh, two more. Um, um, my grandmother got divorced uh, in the 1940s, and of course that, that meant immediate excommunication from the Catholic Church, which, uh, and she played by the rules, you know, she was ashamed and uh, she was broken by that, you know, she could go to church, but she couldn't receive communion, um, and it, it paralyzed her, you know, for years, until I finally, you know, one day took matters uh, in, literally into my own hands. <laughs> And then after I did this, we did this, well, this went on for several years after, after we finally did a bad thing. <laughs> Communion. When the avenue, oh, I should say, <laughs> I mentioned my swimming pool in here. I, was, I, I started out my life on Albany Avenue up in the north end of Hartford. And my swimming pool was a, uh, a bucket that if I, if I folded my knees up to my chin and sat in it, I could, I could fit in the bucket. And then my grandmother would fill it up with cold water. So I'd be like, in, in my pool, you know? So. <laughs> it's crazy. Communion. When the avenue was cleaned by whirlybirds of seeds in a polished city with sparkling windows, I'd sit in a bucket full of water on hot September days, or lie on the cool linoleum floor between my grandmother's big brown shoes and stare up into the mystery of snaps and nylon under her dress. I'm not the only little kid that looked up his grandmother's dress. I, I'm positive. 
I may be the only one willing to admit it, but. <laughs> she was an excommunicant, and Tony, the nice man with a wife and children, would be there most days sitting at the sunny table and speaking so softly I couldn't hear. My grandfather was gone by then, and his red-headed daughter put on a bus to somewhere by her red-headed mother, Jenny the prostitute. And whenever my father, my grandfather did come around, he'd always wipe the corners of his eyes with the backs of his wrists when he spoke to me. The only thing my grandmother ever needed she couldn't have until the day at mass when I drank the blood of Christ, kept it wet on my lips, and took his body cupped in my hands back to her in the pew where I nudged her, opened my hands to the great disobedience and nodded. No, she said, but I kissed her on the mouth, blood of Christ, broke his body, ate half, put the other to her mouth, body of Christ, salvation's relief shining through the guilt in her face. And I'm, I'm going to finish with um, th this is a poem about, this is something everybody knows about. It's that weird thing when you, you open your mouth and say something, and what comes out isn't you, but it's like your father, or your, <laughs> or your mother, or even, what's, and it gets weird, like I hear my grandfather in my daughters. It's the whole thing is very weird. So, um, so this is called Voices. And it's pretty accurate, which is it's odd. And th oh, this is another epigraph from Elizabeth Bishop, too, from her poem in the waiting room. She's a little girl. She's in the dentist's office, right? You know that poem? Yeah. And she hears Aunt Consuela go, oh! And she realizes that it's, she hears her own voice, you know? And so, um, so this is Voices. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice, in my mouth from In the Waiting Room by Elizabeth Bishop, Voices. There are times when in my mother's voice, her father's voice distracts me from her words, doppelganger speak in some translation that sounds as if she's simply saying hi, when in truth it is her father come to say in language of the living that he'd like for me to take a moment and to think of all the time we spent in shady joints, our elbows on a sticky wooden bar, the half-light and acrid smell of booze, stale beer, and the years old reek of smoke. I also hear it when my daughter speaks, my mother's voice addressing me as dad, asking me if I can watch the kids. And when I answer, my aunt, my mother's sister answers back, but with her father's voice, in which I can hear the tinny timber of his eccentric mother, Grandma Far Away, asking us if we'd like some funny water, in a voice my other daughter borrows to bring us up to speed on all her plans, sounding just like Uncle Rocky did when he'd grin a menacing grin and talk about his tennis game or bothering girls in the flickering darkness of the movie theater. And then my boy speaks with his brother's voice, but it's my father calling to say his wife is going to have a child there first. We share the joy with jokes of our advancing age in hopes that it will be a boy to keep our name alive. I smile and clear my throat, but it's my father's throat, my father's cough, and there we are, the living and the dead, the living carrying on as best we can, the dead alive in everything we say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.